where would we be without our technology? So I'm going to talk to you today about what's in the mind of an engineer. Um, <clears throat> I'm not an engineer. I work with a lot of scientists and engineers, and I've talked to them over the years to try to figure out what they're thinking when they design. And it's my hope that by combining some of what I've learned with some very traditional and very interesting, powerful theories in philosophy, namely in the philosophy of mind, we can come up with something that I'm going to call a new ethic of design. Now, you might ask yourself, uh, why do you need a new ethic? What was wrong with the old one? Right? Well, in some sense, the old ethic of design um, follows a saying that uh, a mentor of mine told me a while ago, somebody who actually was a captain of industry, uh, worked for a company that employs a lot of people in the state of Delaware. And you all probably know who that is. So he said in this, in this heavy Scottish brogue, what we do with these products is we throw them over the wall, right, and we see who buys them. And that's the old ethic of design. The test is the marketplace. We design this stuff, and whether it's good or bad will depend on whether it's adopted and, in large part, uh, people accept it. Right. So there is a, there's a little bit of a problem with that, especially in the 21st century. One problem is that there's a whole lot of clutter when we throw things over the wall. Right. Some people will adopt them, some people won't, but after a while, these new technologies will end up in a landfill. Right. So, that's one kind of problem. Another kind of problem is there may actually be technologies that are successful in the marketplace, but otherwise we might not want them to be successful. Some people will adopt them, and the net effect will be harmful. So what I'm going to offer you today, I hope, is a new way of thinking about these objects prior to their entering the marketplace, prior to them being implemented and adopted. So this is at least a, a start on a a new ethic for design, and I, I'm completely convinced that we need it. Think about some of the proposals for um, solving climate change, seeding the oceans to take care of ocean acidification, or blasting small mirrors up into the upper atmosphere. So those are some technologies. Uh, might get us out of a very, very difficult situation. Might be, on the other hand, disastrous. So how do we think about these wide-ranging technologies that could be um, both good in some respects, but also horribly bad. So here's a, here's a model to begin with. Um, we have almost incontrovertible evidence that engineers are also human beings. <laughs> um, and so if we're trying to think about what's in an engineer's mind, why don't we just start out with, well, what's in any human being's mind? When looking at this uh, picture, uh, this morning I realized that that looks a lot like me, except I don't have a coffee. <laughs> so what is it about uh, human minds in general? Well, uh, human minds have mental states. You have them, trust me. If you didn't have them, you wouldn't have gotten here today. You have beliefs, you have desires, and you have um, a very special case of a mental state um, that sometimes we call intentions, but for the purpose of this talk today, I just want you to think of them as plans. And the reason is that I'm going to reserve this term intention for something slightly broader. So what is interesting about mental states? Well, they are intentional in a quite specific sense in which philosophers, especially in the 20th century, decided they were special. Namely, they have a direction. They are about something else. Think about a belief. So a belief is some stuff in your mind that is about some state of affairs in the world. You may have a belief about the weather right now. And if you believed that it was you know, somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees outside, you'd probably be right. And if you believed, on the other hand, that it was snowing, you'd probably be wrong. So there's this very simple relationship between a belief and its content, the thing it's about. The same thing is true in a um, slightly weirder way about fears. You don't have fears full stop, you have fears that are directed or are about something else. You have a fear of spiders. If you have fears generally, that's not a good thing. It's good to have fears with content. Maybe not too many fears. <laughs> now think about plans. Plans are intentional, but they don't point at something that's real yet. Right? They point at something that you want to make real. 
that you intend to do. So all in all, these mental states have this direction, and that's a very powerful tool for thinking about what an agent, somebody who acts, what an agent has in mind prior to acting. So here's something psychologically interesting about these intentional states. Uh, almost every human being generates these intentional states just by contemplating what he or she is going to do tomorrow, or what the weather is like, or what the most pressing fear is right now. And let's, uh, for the time being, call these states entities. If they stay inside the mind, they're just a mental state of belief, a desire, a plan, a fear, whatever it happens to be. And then notice that many of us, on many occasions, externalize those mental states. We take those things that are directed at or about the world, and we produce things like sentences in a language. And sometimes we produce them just by vocalizing, and sometimes we write them up on fancy forms of technology. But the interesting thing about those mental states that are intentional is that they've now come outside of our body. They now have a separate existence, um, even though we generated them. They're ours, but we've given them to the rest of the world. So beyond being psychologically interesting, intentionality is also legally and ethically interesting. And this is so obvious that we don't really think about it very often. But when we hear explanations of why people act in the way that they do, we assume that they act on the basis of those prior intentional states. We assume that people act in most cases on the basis of beliefs and plans. Now, I'm not speaking of involuntary actions like tripping off the stage or coughing or something like that. I'm talking about those actions for which people are typically praised and blamed. In a legal context, sometimes you can get in trouble for having the wrong intentional states prior to your action. Let me give you a simple example here. So uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a belief, intentional state, that there is a burglar downstairs. And you have a fear that the burglar will harm you and you make a plan to go downstairs and knock the person unconscious or do something bad to them. Okay, you're defending yourself. Maybe you're going to have to explain yourself in the court of law. And you say, look, I had no criminal intent. I believed that there was a person trying to hurt me. I had a desire and a plan to make this stop. And so I'm really sorry that that just happened to be my neighbor. Tell the story in another way. You woke up in the middle of the night you believed it was your neighbor, you feared your neighbor, and you had plans to do him in, all the while under the guise of knocking a burglar in the back of the head. So there you go before the court of law and you divulge honestly as you would, divulge exactly what your intentional states were. And now you're in a little more hot water. So it seems, in both cases, the consequence was the same, but it seems that the mental states you had will determine in large part whether we praise or blame you or whether you spend some time um, behind bars. So engineers are, um, remember, human beings. And when they act, what they do is externalize, make external objects out of the plans that they had. They don't design accidentally or as a fit or um, as a result of coughing. They put things into the world that they thought about. They have plans and desires and beliefs and maybe even sometimes fears. And they design objects based on those things. Well, look, just as the person who knocked the burglar or the neighbor in the back of the head acted on the basis of those intentional states, so does the engineer design on the basis of those intentional states. So what does that tell us? We can evaluate designs prior to their entering the marketplace based on the intentional states of the engineer. So that makes um, intentionality, I'm sorry for the word, engineeringly interesting. I had to come up with it, yeah, right? It's engineeringly interesting um, because it seems that every technological artifact is, is, as a matter of fact, a combination of the intentionality of this designer, the engineer, and the user, if they're two different people. Um, it seems that these technological artifacts can be unethical by design or by use or by a combination. If you want an example of that, I'll just throw out here the perfect torture machine. 
a technology that was designed with nothing but evil in mind. Right? Now, you can have all kinds of other combinations of unethical by design and unethical by use, but just contemplate that example for a second. So what really happens when we use a technology, when we end users pick it up and adopt it, is that we're in part borrowing the intentionality of the designer and we're adding hours to it. We create these kinds of super agents. You plus the designer or the engineer. And sometimes those designs facilitate certain things that we can do and sometimes they constrain us. Um, there are very simple examples of this and you're sitting in one right now. Um, most of us uh, bend at the hips and bend at the knees. And as a result of that, some very, very shrewd designer designed this room with these chairs. And, and you're all facing me and you're pointed in this direction. However, if the designer had put these chairs in instead, um, some of you might be facing the back, some of you might be facing out towards the wall. You're constrained. Your action right now, your sitting comfortably, is facilitated by the design, but it's also constrained at the same time. So there are ways in which we are different. Um, yes, most of us bend at the knees and bend at the hips, although you know, as I get older, I do less uh, well with both of those things. Some of us actually um, roll in order to get from point A to point B instead of walk. And if you roll to get from point A to point B, you will find that a 30 degree angle getting up onto a sidewalk is much easier than a 90 degree angle for the wheels by which you move. A very simple difference that makes a huge difference in someone's life if, in fact, he or she rolls to get from point A to point B instead of walks. So buildings are made accessible by these designs. Sidewalks are made accessible. All of social life is facilitated by the simple 30 degree ramp. There are some designs which we might question whether in fact they're environmental friendly. Uh, does anybody know what that is? Well, it's a <coughs> camshaft and a lobe, but just for the purposes of this illustration, it's a camshaft that's going to open up an intake valve on an internal combustion engine. And there's some measurements, just two of them, that are really interesting in this case. One is the height or the distance from the middle to the nose, and one is the distance between the two ramps on the camshaft load. That will determine how much fuel is let in to the internal combustion engine and for how long it's let in. If you want a really fast car, you might have to pump a lot of fuel in there. But notice, whether this is environmentally friendly doesn't depend merely on the engine or on the driver, but it depends on what kinds of resources we have available. If we don't have a lot of fossil fuel to run those things, you might choose one design over another. If you're polluting while you're running one of these things, you might choose one design rather than another. So I'm going to end today with some puzzles. And the reason that I do this is that um, if, if you're a professional philosopher like I am, and you don't end with puzzles, they take your uh, professional philosopher's card away. So it's uh, it's um, part of the, um, the, uh, the guild, as, as it were. So here's one kind of puzzle. I've been talking about designs and technologies that are extended uh, in space and that uh, we encounter when we sit down or when we put on a pair of glasses or when we um, start an internal combustion engine. What about a design that's not extended? What about the design of the internet? It's designed. The way it's designed facilitates some action and constrains us in other ways. One of my favorite uh, cartoons about this, there's a, a dog sitting at a computer. Looks like he's uh, engaged in some sort of chat in an internet chat room. And the owner is looking over the dog's shoulder. And the dog says to the owner, on the internet, no one knows your dog, <laughs> right? a feature that we call anonymity, something that we tend to like, or that some of us tend to like, and that some of us then get in trouble about later on when they send pictures of oneself over the internet. <laughs> What's the other punchline of the cartoon? Well, it's not said, but on the internet, internet no one knows you're not a dog. There's anonymity on one hand, and there is the difficulty in authenticating proving that you are who you are. It would be very nice if we could prove in many 
internet commercial transactions that indeed we are who we are. We're the holder of that MasterCard. But the way the internet is designed, we have a premium or we've placed a premium on anonymity and authentication asserting validly that I am who I am is less of an important function. So here's another mystery about the new ethic of design. Suppose that, um, like wildfire, my philosophical ideas spread through the engineering community. Why not? Um, that may not be enough, because engineers typically work for companies, and while they may be sitting back thinking, okay, what are my plans? How does that jive with my responsibility towards those people who will then utilize my technologies? The company may just say, throw it over the wall. Put it in the marketplace. We'll see if it sinks or if it swims. So it's not just enough to change the minds of engineers. You have to change companies. And typically, companies don't have minds. There are these strange things, a constellation of minds, but not one mind. So that's a difficult problem. Finally, I want to leave you with a puzzle that I think about a lot, because uh, <coughs> one of the areas in which I do research is the ethics of robotics. So right now, we have um, standard computer-aided design software that more or less works out the physics and the mathematics for us if we're designing something. What if we, in the future, in the very near future, create the intelligent computer-aided design that designs as well as does the physics and math? Now, of course, somebody will have designed that robot, so maybe you have some sort of regress of responsibility. But now we're not talking about just doing science and math. We would be allowing the machine to make design decisions. And if I'm right that we need a new ethic for design, we would have to somehow implement in that machine an ethical ability to choose good design from bad design. I promised you that I would give you an example. And this is an example that always um, strikes me as a case of just astoundingly bad design. There are a lot of things that are well designed in this little implement computers, the internet. Think about the design of the landmine that when pressure of 30 pounds hits the sensing device of this landmine, it's going to go off. Think about that same landmine that is active not for oh, a few years or the the best projection of hostilities, but a landmine that is active for 100 years, or maybe even 200 years. So in some sense, an engineer may be really proud of that design. So, oh, hair trigger landmine, it's going to last forever. That's a case of bad design. And it's a case also that would have, I think, under a new ethic of, of design, never have been allowed. Right? So we can think about designs, think about the way in which they change the world, um, and hopefully make the world a little better place. I happen to believe that we're going to need a lot more technology for the future and not less. We have problems to solve, but we need wise technology and we need wise engineers to make it. Thank you very much.